topics, right? Talk about the benefits of this. Oh, nice. The reason we did it. Talk about yeah. the reason we did it. Oh, yeah. Who, why we chose who we did. Hello. All right. I think we are live. Are we live? Although last time we got like a little countdown. We'll never something. know. We'll never know. Is anybody out there, if you are, please post in the comments. Uh, say hi. Tell us where you're from. Tell us if you have a dog with you. Oh, are these comments? There's any comments. Oh, yeah. I'm on the private chat. Let me go over to comments. Oh, my goodness. Yes, yeah. there are. I mean, okay. hello. I even see the screen. Uh, you, don't, you don't need to look at the comments, Dad. We'll tell All you right. when there's things for you to look at. But yes, it looks like we're live. Um, we've already got some questions. Well, we're going to give people a moment to filter Hello, in. Hello, everybody. Portugal, Wisconsin. Questions. Oh, there's a question for me. Um, mm. uh, we can put that question away. We're, we'll get to it in a moment. But, uh, hi from Vancouver. Hello, hello, everyone. My favorite. How do you train a dog who's not food or toy motivated? Oh, yes, we can get to that Vancouver one. Island. Very close to me in Vancouver Island. I'm over at Port Angeles right now. I can wave to you. Um, let's see. North Oregon, also close to me. We have a Get GSP listening to us, too. Yodi, the GSP. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, here, too. Everybody see Laz? Hey, Laz. Hey, Laz. Here's my baby boy. Oh. He, just, he hurt himself yesterday, so he's spending extra time with me. Oh. He tripped and fell awkwardly. It was kind of just embarrassing. He's fine, but he's a little sore. He just was kind of tripped. Pride, was his pride injured as well? I Ooh, think maybe a worse. little. It was awkward. Pride, pride. That's painful. Ooh, yeah. right. He's hanging out. Canada. He, he hangs out a lot of the time anyway, even when he's feeling good. He likes to be in the office with me. Oh, Michelle's here with one of Julie's service dogs. Oh, cool. From Chile. Oh, wow. Wonderful, yeah, wonderful, right. wonderful. All right. I like that. Oh, Washington. I should visit you. I love wolfhounds. They're on my list. <laughs> oh, I don't know where that town is. I'm All right. Washington. Well, it is 1.03 p.m. I think that's enough time for people to filter in. Obviously, uh, people will continue to join us as we go, but I want to welcome everyone to our Dog Training Secrets Summit Closing Session and Howlathon. Okay, well, we'll do a coordinated howl later. That was just a pre. I know you were. Like werewolves, not swearwolves. No, that was a howl. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't know if any of you have ever attended one of uh, Ian's seminars or workshops, but frequently they end in a nice communal Ooh. howl, which. Mm, uh, yeah. Is good for humans as well as dogs. The pack is so eager to get out of there. <laughs> no, <laughs> not at all. All right. So today we're going to take a few questions. Ooh. We're going to let off some steam in classic canine fashion. Uh, we're going to celebrate the conclusion of this wonderful summit. And we're going to make an, an exciting announcement. So um, I'm actually going to start with the <laughs> announcement <laughs> because we don't want anyone to miss it. <laughs> it's very important. <laughs> Jerry. <laughs> would, would you like to make the announcement or should I, should I go ahead? Oh, it'd be much quicker if I made it. It would be, it would, but yes. it might not be as clear. So uh, who knows? Um, so this summit, as some of you probably know, was brought to you in large part by us, the Dunbars and Dunbar Academy. And uh, Dunbar Academy, if you don't know, is our website where we sell dog behavior and training courses for primarily regular dog owners, but also some for professional dog trainers. For the past few years, we've been offering a membership program that is I'd say a truly unbeatable value, uh, but this deal is actually going to disappear forever in a few days. So we wanted to tell you about it before it's too late. The program is called the Top Dog Academy. It provides access to all of our dog training content for one low monthly fee. We have hundreds of hours of dog training videos with dozens of courses, including the Behavior Problems Compendium, the new Essential Puppy Training course, which is what uh, Kelly's presentation, one of her presentations was taken from, the treatment of prevention, pre treatment and prevention of dog aggression, the reactivity workshop, the Serious Dog Trainer Academy, and many others. We have ebooks, podcasts, Q and A, seminars, workshops, and more. And for now, at least, when you join the Top Dog Academy, you also get access to personalized email support. So if you have a question about dog training or behavior, and you email us, and you're a Top Dog Academy member, we will give you the answer. We'll make sure you get the information. Mm -hmm you need 
to train your dog. But this is what's going to be changing <laughs> in a few days. Um, we're going to be, we've been growing a lot lately and we realized we can't continue to offer this personalized support to all of our new members. So in the future, uh, new members who join after February 16th will no longer get personalized email support. They might also see a price increase and they might not get access to all future courses. But if you join before February 16th, you'll be a legacy member and you'll be uh, you'll get access to personalized email support as long as you remain a member. Uh, so we want to make sure you have an opportunity to get in before this offer expires on February 16th. And of course, as always, we offer a 30 day money back guarantee. If you're not totally blown away by the Top Dog Academy. You can just let us know. We'll give you a full refund. We'll cancel your subscription. No questions asked. Um, so we hope you'll join us. We'll hope you'll join the Top Dog Academy family. Uh, we would love to show you what we can do for you and your dog. So did you, did you mention the monthly price? Did I mention? Oh, yes. Like so the low monthly price of $20 US per month. Uh, so that and is legacy that. does include current members. You're, that's what the legacy is. It's, you guys are the legacy if you're already a member. Right. And we obviously do answer the questions. Um, it's a lot of time. And a labor of love at times, but um, yeah, it's you know it is probably not scalable for the forever. As to get the numbers really grow, slow. it just becomes next. Well, level. we're doing it. You know, Jamie's doing it. We, you know, we're doing it. Um, In the future, so anyway. we consider offering personalized email support as an additional upgrade. We've yet to finalize that plan, but if it becomes available, it will be as an added uh, upgrade on top of the Top Dog Academy. But if you sign up now you'll have it for as long as you remain a member. <laughs> so there's a link on the on the screen if you want to check it out and learn more. Um, we would love to help you out. And uh, that's it for now. We're going to jump into some questions. Karen has a question that's related to what you were just speaking about. Um, Karen has completed the serious course. I'm assuming she means in the Top Dog Academy. And um, are there extras in, um, in Top Dog? Well, there's tons of extras in Top Dog. From I mean, we, if you completed the series course, was it in person? Because that I mean, that's great. That's excellent if you if you were able to do that. Um, but guess. in Top Dog, there's tons of material, not just series puppy class, but we have puppy two, don't we? We have adolescent classes. We have problem solving. We have games. Right? There's tons. Yeah, it often lives. It could also be she was talking about the Serious Dog Trainer Academy, which is a, a lecture intended for professional dog trainers. Yeah, but um. Oh. And so, okay. to the essential puppy training we'll see course. maybe she'll maybe she'll clarify but uh let's jump into some of your puppy and dog behavior questions we are having a wolfhound love fest in the comments here and i got invited to go look at the wolfhounds and meet 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 with everybody in washington but look we've got wolfhound in the czech republic we've got wolfhounds love i don't know it's, it's a wolfhound kind of day i don't know all right welcome to all the wolfhounds out there um so karen says you and me if she remembers correctly. Okay, yeah. Uh, so it's so a four-day seminar then. That's one four-day seminar. Top Dog is basically Ian's brain downloaded over the past 50 years of all of his knowledge and education, or maybe more than 50 years. I mean, you're more than 50 years, aren't you? So <laughs> when to, did you start learning? Well, when did the wisdom begin, Ian? Was it 50 years ago? Was it 70 when years did ago? Start learning, did you say? Wisdom. When did the wisdom The wisdom. Begin? Well, the doggy wisdom started in <laughs> 1967 when um, I was in the library at the Royal Veterinary College and we were given one week to research a topic of interest and I'd come across a Michael Fox article on socialization in dogs. And then I thought, I don't want to be a practicing veterinarian. I want to be a doggy behaviorist. And so uh, Michael's advice, I applied to Berkeley um, because he knew Frank Beach and I just, I loved it. So I joined the PhD program. And then um, it was just wonderful that my passion then became my job. We could all be so lucky. Yep. That's, yeah. That's, that's, oh, look, that's 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 forward. Saw uh, Ian in Florida around 40 years ago. Yeah. Good Lord. One of your first seminars in Florida. Wow. All right, so Kelly, I wanted to start off okay. with a question we um we actually didn't get to from our last Q and A, which is a uh, a perennial question we always like to uh we always seem to get and always like to answer. Uh, what's the best way to get a young puppy to stop biting? Well, 
Um, the short answer is you don't, not right away anyway. Puppies bite and um, it's natural, it's normal. Um, the second, I, I, would, I would ask a question back right at you, which is how old is your puppy? Because a puppy is only a puppy as long as they have puppy teeth. Already in, and so by the time they have um, at least half of their canine, and the canines kind of come in, I think, last or almost last in the process of tooth losing and, and growth, um, your puppy is beginning to be an adolescent, kind of a tween. And by the time they have all their big dog teeth, they're no longer a puppy. If your puppy is biting, good for you. Be thankful. It's annoying. It's a stage. They do somewhat grow out of it on their own, but there are, of course, things that we can do to temper their bite over the next the, the few weeks of puppyhood that we have to deal with that. Um, you know, initially you're going to allow kind of a lot of biting, but mostly just on your hands, not on your hair, not on your clothes, um, not on your bum necessarily. A lot of puppies are little bum and ankle biters. You're just gonna let them bite your hands where you can give feedback. Your hands are pretty tough. They're pretty resilient, um, but yet they're delicate as well. They're, they're sensitive um, in a way that of course your hair isn't or um, maybe your forearm isn't. So you'll get to really feel the pressure that your puppy is biting or gnawing with and give them some feedback because we believe in, correct me if I'm wrong, that the puppies are designed with such razor sharp, tiny little teeth and their tiny little jaws so that they can get a lot of feedback from the world, including their mother, starting with late with nursing, right? As their teeth come in and with their litter mates and their group mates and friends um, and the people around them so that they learn Oh, these, these are actually quite dangerous tools I've got in my mouth, and I've got to be careful with them. You know, it's part of the socialization process to, um, you know, to, to learn how to be gentle with their jaw. So the puppies are supposed to be getting feedback from others about their teeth, but they're also supposed to be exploring the world. It's like toddlers, you know, fingers, you know, they, they get into everything. They're going to taste things, they're going to touch things, they're going to explore things, and they start to learn what they should and shouldn't do. So we tolerate a certain amount of biting. Certainly there's nothing wrong with um, also redirecting to appropriate toys sometimes, you know, making sure you have soft, squishy toys around that they can sink their teeth into or rubbery toys or you know, find your dog's favorite textures and have toys that they can, they can chew on when they need a good chew. But a lot of times puppies just need to bite. Um, and there's also different levels of bite. Is it soft? Let them do it. If it gets too hard, oh, give them some feedback. Don't don't jerk away though. Oh, tell them no. Wait them out. Shun them for a second. Give them a little little break, for social break, and then start again. So they learn that biting too hard stops the interaction, and, and think, they will learn to be more careful. If you're interested in seeing videos about this kind of done developmentally, starting with reacting to very little to a you know to harder bites, and then reacting to softer bites, and then using off and redirection. To check out the essential puppy training course in the Top Dog Academy, where Kelly has multiple videos where she demonstrates these concepts. Uh, for our next question from Michelle, she says, How do you train a dog who doesn't seem to be food or toy motivated? You want to take that one, Dad? Yeah, it's a very common question. It's uh, I just rephrase it and say, How do you train a dog who doesn't sit? Well, you teach them to sit. Or, How do you train a dog to pick up objects to the floor and retrieve your slippers? You train them to do it. And so if your dog doesn't naturally go bonkers over food or a tennis ball or a tug toy, you train him to be a foodaholic. And so basically it's a good old pre-mac principle. You hand feed him boring old kibble. And as he eats a bit, something gets good. Like he gets a tummy rub or another bit of kibble. Now you scratch his ears. Another bit of kibble, you throw a ball. Another bit of kibble on the couch. So, you know, most dogs, though, do like kibble. If you're not feeding from a bowl and you hand feed it, then they view it as a treat because it comes from the human hand. But for those that don't, this then is your first step in training. Why? If they do like kibble, if they do like toys, they are just so trainable and you're going to zip along training your dog so quickly. All right. Thanks, Dad. That was short. Wasn't it? That was very short. I'm, I'm really, very, I'm really, very really trying. Yeah, yes. well done. You deserve a yes. treat. I wish I yeah. had my treat jar here. <laughs> yeah, I wish I had my treat jar. I just got a can of uh, flavored La Croix. La Croix. Ah oui, La Croix. All right, how about this question? Uh, trying to teach my 14-year-old Palm Chi with hearing loss not to react to other dogs. Uh, trying Michael Shikashio's tip to reward 
they'll look at another dog with a high value treat. Uh, okay to treat, watch me. Um, do either of you want to jump on that one? Well, if you have a deaf dog, um, you need some form of communication and most people get a vibration collar or if on leash, um, a lot of the old time obedience uh, instructors would praise their dog by going doo -doo 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 down the leash. And of course, that's trained in by doo -doo, treat, doo -doo -doo, treat and so on. Mm -hmm. So it is possible to give feedback. But a, a big tip, even though your dog can't hear you, do speak to him as if he could, because when you speak, if you say, boy, there's a good dog, everything changes, your facial expressions and your body actions. You know, you start to bob and move and that they can read like a book. So when your dog sees another dog, get happy, dance a jig, use Bill Campbell's jolly routine. It's amazingly effective because the dog then thinks, what are you doing? So now they've turned away from eyeballing the other dog. So they turn around and look at you. And most German shepherds freak out like, what are you doing? You know, we did not come to the park to have fun. This is serious. Yeah. So, yeah. Talk to your dog. Pretend he can hear and the dog will read your face and your body. But also I would get a signaling device if your dog's off leash in the dog park. But you can use your leash when he's on leash. All right. And and but you know, a short addition to that would be, uh, you know, yes, what Michael's doing is is obviously very a very good idea. But you can have your dog wash you, as Ian said. It's 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 fine to do. Um, you know, have a little compassion. Not that you don't, but we have to remember when they get older, they do get more reactive. Remember, Dune started get startling when he get you can't hear. The world gets kind of isolated and smaller. So anything that you can do to just you know add some support. Would be would be a good idea. Um, classical condition, looking at the other dogs is great, but teaching them to look at you for comfort and support and, and a jolly routine would be an excellent, excellent idea too. All right, I've got another question lined up, but this is actually the last question I have. I think from this current live Q and A session. So if you have questions, feel free to post them in the comments now. So really? we can answer them. Um, maybe maybe I've missed some. I'll I'll scroll back through the comments. It can be a little hard to uh, to look at the comments and do the talking yes. all at the same time. But uh, I do have one lined up for you, Kelly. Uh, Memzi Meets World says, uh, I loved your presentation on the Open Paw program. I was wondering if you had any advice on implementing for a smaller scale shelter with fewer resources. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Um, I don't know how small your shelter is um, or how few resources you have, but we did develop the program. We didn't film the, the open paw video you saw was not filmed in the, the shelter that we um, developed in, in a very small local shelter in Berkeley that had at the time of our inception, nine active volunteers um, for a shelter that had over, about 50 dog kennels and okay. probably yeah. half that amount um, maybe double that amount of cats. Um, so, and a staff of maybe 12. So it was done on a, it was developed on a shoestring budget. Um, we didn't have any money. We used, we used, you know, people and we tried to be efficient with our processes and um, you don't need a ton of people. You just need people that are trained well and have direction and, and know what they're supposed to be doing. I find that so many volunteers um, over after polling and training volunteers for the past 20 years while doing Open Paw are feeling underutilized and overwhelmed when they uh, join a shelter. So that can lead to attrition or just kind of crazy willy nilly who knows what who's doing what, which is a lot of wasted time. Um, often the same few dogs are being walked or cats are being fed and, and played with because they're the easy ones or they're the favorites. And there's always somebody with a bad rep that nobody wants to take out. And you know, if you have a simple chart that says, for instance, so-and-so got walked, pottied, played, level three every day, and so-and-so didn't get any of that or only got level one, it's very hard for people to look at a, a chart and, and deny um, you know, training and care for the animals. I don't mean daily care like feeding, but you know, extracurricular care for an animal that hasn't yet had any. So it helps people to focus and hone in on who needs what exactly just by simply having a chart, a whiteboard, but also again, training your volunteers in the priorities uh, to help the animals get adopted and stay adopted 
um, will will help tremendously with getting um, more work done during the day because a lot of uh, mentality of volunteers is simply to um, they, they they want they, they want this dog this day to be this dog's best day. They're not thinking you know about tomorrow. They're not thinking about the future. They're thinking this dog is sad today. It makes me uncomfortable seeing them here. I want today to be a happy day for them, and that's great. However, I want the rest of their life to be their best day, and the best way they can do that is by getting out of the shelter. And the best way we can do that is by training them. However, training can also be their best day every day in the shelter because it should be fun and interactive and teach them to be calm and confident and, you know, and get them some skills to show off to people rather than having them be stressed or sad. So um, you don't need a lot of people. You just need a good training program and a little bit of organization. And you'd be surprised what you can get through in a day with um, just a few, a few dedicated people that are all on the same page. Yeah, I wish we had actually filmed it when you were doing the program at Berkeley because it really was a tiny so center um, and it was a miserable place to visit. It was smelly. It was oh, uh, ugly. ugly. But once we got in, uh, it was it two to three hundred volunteers. This was a magical place to visit. Number one, when you would walk in the shelter, all the dogs would sit and look at you. It, made, it was like... Quiet. Barkless, it was a barkless facility, and the not only were the volunteers, I, I think, happy and they felt fulfilled because they were given an education, a four step education in how to change these dogs' lives, and they could see it. And then, much later, the staff started smiling and grinning because th there was some resistance to starting it, largely from the board. And oh, we don't have enough time. Why? Well, we spend our day clearing up dog poop. Ah, well, well not the board, the, the employees, not yeah, the board. Employees, yeah, I mean, busy. we're busy. Yeah, mm -hmm. we're busy. But they they really took pride in this, and it was a great sense of fulfillment for them because it really, truly was a cross between a canine country club and a university, and um, it is just marvelous to see. So you don't need the money, you don't need the space. What you need is the volunteers to teach. And then do all the work with the dogs and cats. Couldn't be doggish here. <laughs> all right. Thanks, guys. Um, all right. Here's another question from Christina. How do I stop my dog from barking at my neighbor? You want to start take a first crack at this one, Dad? Yeah. Well, you know, it's like when dogs do things that upset you or, or annoyance, what have you, I, I like to employ the maxim, if this is wrong, what is right? Well, you want your dog to be quiet, so then teach him to shush on cue. If your dog's humping another dog, teach him to get off on cue, or maybe to sit on cue. You can't sit and hump at the same time. So how do we teach the dog to um, shush on cue? Well, we can do it in real time. You know, the dog barks, so we say, number one, Rover shush. Number two, we waggle a food treat in front of his nose. Number three, when he sniffs the treat, he'll stop barking because you can't sniff and bark at the same time. So then we praise, good dog, good dog, good dog, and give him the treat. So you could do it in the course of everyday living, but to some people that's very difficult because you're distracted. So I suggest you troubleshoot it. You practice shush 100 times in a row. How do you do that? Well, you teach dog to bark on cue. That's easy. Rover, speak. Woo, 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 woo. Good dog, good dog. You do that about six to eight times. Now the dog will bark. Sorry to wake you up, Laz. The dog will bark when you say speak. So now you can say shush. And you practice this woof, shush sequence um, just about 10, 20, 30 times. And then the dog's got it. Like, oh, you mean if you say shush, you want me to stop barking and come to you? And then I can get petted and get a treat? Yeah. So it, like all training, it comes down to clear verbal communication that you've taught the dog to understand. Excellent. Yep. Uh, Kelly, a slightly different, uh, slightly different question. Joanna uh, says, oh, go ahead. How to stop your dog from fence aggression with a neighbor dog? So not barking at the human neighbor, but. I mean, to me, it's the same question, just a different species in a sense. Um, and, you know, I'm dealing with this right now. We talked about this in the Friday Live, I think. Um, I've got um, a fence line that runs many acres um, with the neighbor. And they have had, I've been here a year and a half now. They've had 
a dog that was here when we got here that was, you know, an adult female, pretty mellow. She barked a few times when we first moved here, but my dogs didn't respond. and They just, you know, neutral. And then they got a puppy last summer, and that was fine. He's cute. He's always looking. Labrador, he's looking at, at us through the fence. Um, but um, now he's an adolescent lab Labrador, and he's got a lot of energy, and those dogs are outside all day. And so now when we come and we're doing any activities in the back, rah, 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 he comes over and my dogs have started orienting to it some more than others, uh, especially my adolescent Melva, MJ, who thinks, wow, this is so much fun. I didn't know we could do this. And I'm thinking, well, you can't. Don't get your hopes up. <laughs> um, so, you know, uh, we are doing a lot of um, of classical conditioning. See, uh, and the thing is to be fast, right? And like you, if you want it to have an emotion, to be the emotional response, maybe it's a prolonged reward in the long run, but you've got to hit them with the reward before there's a reaction, if at all possible. So what is that distance from your fence line? You know, I know those dogs are out there, so I don't wait till we get to the fence to start trying to train my dog. I can see her looking and looking for them the minute we step out my door, which is, you know, pretty far from the fence line. So, you know, we start with that. As soon as she, you know, senses them, I'm going to reward her for not reacting because she's not reacting yet. We're still really far away. She can't even see them. She just knows they're coming. And we, we gradually work towards the fence. Um, I might have a line on her. I might not. Depends on the day. Depends on her energy level. By line, I mean a long line just so I can stop her charging and, and, and doing the fence running. Um, and so I can control her distance from the distraction. And, um, you know, within a, 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 actually, I think two sessions, we, I got to the point where she should now look at them and then look at me. Basically, you want the cue for the dog to be, to look to you, as Ian said, with the, you know, with the, um, the even with a, like with a palm. These are all kind of the same thing. These dogs are reacting to something in their environment. It's overwhelming them, whether it's excitement, fear, stress, hate, love, it, it doesn't matter. You know, if they're if they're overwhelmed with emotion and to the point where they're not able to contain themselves, pull them back, if at all possible, which generally is somehow to an area, a, a space, you know, arranged to where they are able to control themselves, even ever so briefly and reward that. Um, give them something else to do. Reward classically condition them to, to enjoy and not overreact to those to those stimulus, but also to. Um, Give them something else to do. Come look at me. Come and get your ball. Get your tug. The beautiful thing is within a few days of her, MJ, not reacting to this adolescent and his loony tune. So it's the two loons trying to communicate through the feds. It's, you know, they're not even angry with each other. They're just fools. You know, um, he stopped because she's not getting the feedback. There's no feedback loop now. You know, he now comes and looks. And she looks at him. And then she looks at me. And I'm like, good girl. Come over here. Feed, feed, feed. Throw your ball. Let him look at him again. Yay, come here. Come back up a little bit. Come to me. And he's watching. And now he's not running and barking. And now they can kind of look at each other. And we reward that. And then we move along. And we keep it short and sweet. And, you know, it's just a matter of days before you have most of the control that you want. But they are adolescents. So you're going to have to take a little more time. If you can set up a double barrier for a little while, that would be good, too, for safety and just to give you a little bit of space, even if it's a little snow fence or something or a little blockage so that you don't have them going nose to nose to nose. I don't know what kind of fence you have. Um, but the, the, you're going to have to be present and you're going to have to actively change this behavior for a while before you can just expect them to have a new normal. I think, you know, Anything the, else? a major thrust, of course, Kelly, you know. <laughs> <laughs> How difficult it is for me to be quiet. A major thrust. Of this You're doing summit. so good, Dad. Thank you. Major thrust. I can see him. Summit. I can see his eyes as I was speaking. He could barely wait to say what he wanted. No, I wasn't. I was listening to you and nodding. You know, um, but I liked your your last sentence, which was a major thrust of this summit. That so much of solving a problem, the training happens before the event. You know, a lot of people ignore their dogs and it does something they don't like. It jumps on a child or it fence fights or barks another dog, you know, and then they generally get mad. They moan because that's the human way. Take the good for granted and moan at the bad. And some people get delight yeah. in moaning. And so I would say the most important thing is engage with your dog on walks and when he's off leash, even if it's your own property, talk to him, especially praise him for not barking. 
especially if he sees another dog a hundred yards away. Oh, good boy. Yeah, that's a dog. And then step back, turn him around so you can pet him and maybe offer a treat. Praise him when the other dog's closer. Praise him when they're nose to nose. And if they bark, say, hey, shush, which we taught him with the prior question. So he understands now what we want. Oh, you don't want me to bark? Yeah, that, that's the problem. Please sniff. Let the other dog turn around, sniff his butt. Enjoy this interaction, but you do it quietly. And if he barks after I say, shush, I just say, hey, inside. And I say it like I mean it, which you know I seldom do because I'm not a great authoritarian. But I say, inside, go on, inside for the rest of your life. Go on. And the dogs get that I'm serious. I'm not, of course. It's all an act. And they look at me like, oh, really? I say, now, there's a good dog. Yeah, you can sniff quietly. And we, we actually have a dog next door now called Lobo. And he only speaks Spanish, but he fence fights. And we're out there with six dogs playing. So he's running the fence and barking. So I just took down two of the females and said, hey, Lobo, come here. Now, I turned the dogs around so that, you know, shoulders are between my legs and the butt was towards the chain link fence. And he sort of went, you know, he's going, woo, 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 woo. Oh, God, yeah, <laughs> yeah, like this. Because you can't sniff and bark at the same time. Now, it's right near my potting shed. I have a bag of treats down there for Lobo. Because he's out all the time, you know, and he mm -hmm. barks and barks. I say, hey, Lobo, come here, sit. Good boy. Oh, bravo, Lobo. He speaks Spanish. And I give him his treats. Uh -huh. I can now stop him barking from a distance. I say, you're out there, Lobo. And then one day, the little boy is in charge of him. He's about six. I said, do you want to bring Lobo around to meet our dogs? So He was so scared. Poor guy. But bit by bit, he learned. To, I wouldn't say he ran with the pack, but he said hello to everyone. And, you know, and so, yeah, I think controlled nose to nose and quiet with lots of praise when it actually happens. And it, to me, this is, um, I think it's a huge hole in training these days. We're not giving the running commentary, um, you know, which is the richest feedback of all. Instead, we'll talk about ridiculous reinforcement schedules you know, variable ratio or something, which no one can calculate and train a dog at the same time. No, it should be continuous. It should be binary. It should be analog and always instructive because that provides feedback and then lets the dog know how he would like it to act with the favorite words being shush, lie down, settle down or find your Kong. So I, I think it's we really have to get back to doing that again. And it used to be, you know, it was all on leash. So we didn't give instructions. We just jerked the leash, you know. And now people are just into they think a treat's it. It's not when compared to a dog's butt or the fun of running a fence and barking for joy. Mm -hmm. We've yeah. got to get back to praising our dogs and giving them a running commentary. And the, the voice is so rich. And you, you can see the dogs reading us and think, like, you, you're happy when I run the fence? Yeah, quietly. I mean, I'll, I'll even pave it for you if you like, you know, but quietly. All right. Thanks, guys. Um, Alan writes, how should I go about introducing my five-month-old Sheltie to a dog park? She is fearful of other dogs and has not been well socialized. I want to let you take the first crack at this one, Ian. Um, yeah, dog park's a great place to train your dog, uh, especially if you stay outside. You know, first, you train your dog at home. You know, we had the number of presentations on this. Train your dog to follow, to sit, to heal, to stay at home. Then in your yard, do it outside. Then right in front of your house. You know, most people go straight from the house, the dog's never been outside, and walk the dog to the dog park. And before they know it, they come back with an adolescent dog that's out of control, out of touch. So since it's five months old, right now it's going to start becoming fearful of things and that will increase as it gets older. So I would go to the dog park and sit outside for an hour and a half, do your emails, have a picnic, hand feed the dog. And if it's too scared of that, then sit 25 yards away and do it gradually. And eventually when you're up to the fence, the dog will have some friendly nose to nose sniffs and then a couple of scary ones where the other dog barks, but they gradually get used to it. 
before you bite the bullet and go in like we did with Wookiee. Wookiee was thrown out of obedience class um, because everyone was scared of him. But by the third session, he went into a dog park for the first time. And if you watch the owner trying to enter the park, I mean, he actually spent about 10 minutes trying to walk up to the gate, you know, he'll sit, he'll sit, and he was really panicked. And then when he got there, he opens the gate, and remember that dog comes out off leash straight up to him, and then the lady with two little dogs, and that's it. Then he's in the park, and he gets his life back again. He can, he can play with dogs and run with dogs and chase them and be chased and sniff butts. And, you know, it's, it's very scary for people. But for the dog, when they're bumped into that, provided, you know, the dogs are cool in the dog park, which they usually are. So don't walk straight in. Wait and look at the dogs. Are they all playing? If there's one you don't like, then don't go in, sit outside. So lots of time spent outside the park praising your dog and feeding him his dinner there. All right, Kelly. Uh, Annabelle asks. Come on, wait. Uh, oh, yeah. You want to weigh yeah. in? Oh, sounds Please. good. I would say um, alternate. I thought I gave the complete answer there. What could you possibly well, say? There's no complete <laughs> answer. Please. I would tell. say, I mean, why Why do you want to take your, your Sheltie into the dog park? I mean, maybe your Sheltie doesn't want to go to the dog park. Maybe your Sheltie wants to play with one dog. Maybe your Sheltie wants to play with you. Maybe your Sheltie wants to go for walks and sniffs. Um, it's it may, I mean, if it's super important um, to you, then that's something, you know, then work on what Ian, Ian is, is discussing. Um, and if it's just about general confidence building, I'm all for that for sure. Oh, gradually over time, I love the idea of being outside of the dog park. But the old thing, people think that the ultimate goal is that your dog has to go to the dog park. It isn't, you know, dog parks, uh, I am not such a fan always. Um, yes, there are some cool ones. And yes, in certain urban environments, it's an absolute must or, you know, it's a necessity or a joy. But also sometimes it's a place where people just check out and let their dogs run free and like, you know, just do whatever the heck. And that's not necessarily cool. So, you know, if, if not every dog enjoys daycare, not every dog enjoys a big group, not every person wants to have go to parties, they'd rather go for a walk with their friends. You know, it, it doesn't have to be a dog park dog. Um, your dog doesn't have to be a dog park dog. And um you know, work on other other fun things you can do to build confidence. Although I do think it's worth just building confidence in the presence of other dogs and in a more busy environment, depending on where you live. I think I shall have to weigh in since you weighed in. Um, in all training, it's always Shelter's choice. And so all these things Kelly's mentioning. Even if you have a German Shepherd. Yeah, yeah, but even if the dog's. <laughs> Shelter's yeah. choice. A little <laughs> pity, or, yeah, but you're talking about a Sheltie, so it's Sheltie's choice. It's the dog's choice, and people often, I think, you know, push their view of what dogs should do for enjoyment on the dog. No, they need choice, and that was another, I, it was the words that came up in this summit frequently by many speakers, focus, engagement, relationship, choice. A lot of speakers, and it's why, of course, we've always trained dogs off-leash because now you know what the dog wants to do. Does it want to play? Does it want to play with this dog that's been accused of being a bully? Does it want to hide? Does it want to lie down? And if it's a show of fear and anxiety, I do like to build confidence because we never know what will happen. All of a sudden, you know, you're in a quiet park, you walk and five dogs come rushing in. I want your dog to be prepared for that and not panic. <laughs> but ask them. And the way you ask them is by having them on a loose leash and seeing did they go forward, backward, or lie down, or having them off leash. And they will tell you all you need to know. Yeah, reading your dog's body language and cues. There's a specific question that I would like to answer. I don't know if you've really chosen it or not yet, Jamie. Uh, you can, I you, think if you if you just- Why don't you ask it of you yourself it. and yeah, ask you your it. own question? Well, it's about evaluating how to evaluate a good puppy class. Uh, you see that one? one? Yeah. yeah. You want to you want to start out by answering it? <laughs> okay. Um, basically, how do, how should I evaluate a puppy here, here, class? Here, let's, let's do this the right way. Ready, <laughs> Kelly? How should I evaluate a puppy class? I don't. I li I live in a rural area with few options. This was a typo. The person wrote a follow up. They do live in a rural area with few options. Um, oh, I mean, if you have few options, that's kind of a bummer in that sense, because you have to kind of either go with what is is there or create your own program. Um, 
in, in my mind, a good puppy class is a class that isn't all about puppy puppy socialization, meaning puppy play only, but is more about the hands off, off leash relationship building training that you can do in a classroom training in traffic with other puppies being kind of loose and doing the same thing. One of the nicest things about classes in general, um, you know, one of the pros of taking a class, let's say, you know, versus um, a private session, is that you've got a bunch of people and dogs in the same boat. And so you're all on the same page, training the same agenda, which means you have support and help. So for instance, if a puppy is learning to recall from distractions of, of puppy play and, and doesn't come right away, you can have all the other owners engage their own puppies or hold their collars so you can get your puppy back. And they learn that the play ends and the, you know, the puppy play ends until I listen to my owner and then the play begins again, things like that. So, you know, that it's, it's about, you know, what are they focusing on? Are they focusing on play and, 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 and interspecies socialization? Because puppies need that, but they also already kind of have that. And, and you don't need as much of that as you think at a certain age. Um, is it all on leash? If it is, is it all just kind of formal obedience and the puppy isn't learning to play and or just build a relationship with you? I mean, when they're babies, you've got them. They're little sponges and they look at you like you're, you know, you're the the best thing since sliced bread, you know, they love you. They're, they're, they're needy. They're clingy. They follow you. And you only have that for a few weeks. So this is the time to get that bungee cord really kind of attached and, and stretchy, you know, um, and teach them, you know, to, to, to check in frequently, to want to follow you, to want to be around you when you don't need a lot of extra bells and whistles and equipment and fanfare. I mean, certainly, certainly you want it to be fun, but, um, you know, it, it should be easy to start with young puppies and, and, and get them to want to be around you, get them to enjoy training without a lot of leash work or limitations. Um, it's the best chance you've got. So um, those are the two things that I would say. I'm sure Ian has more, but um, that's what I would look at first. We just re-emphasize, re you know, to get the best bang for your buck, it needs to be off leash. The major reason to be there is for dogs to meet all the other owners in class, dog people socialization, and then for the owners to learn off-leash control uh, in the most difficult of settings. Nothing will be more difficult than week one in puppy class, but out of this, the class morphs into this. The puppies are off-leash for 55 minutes, and then it's training, and then a quick 30 seconds play, then training for five minutes, then sit stays, down stays, some healing, back to a short play, and so on. I think what you don't want in the puppy class is where it's on leash and you sit on a chair listening to the trainer talk and you learn on leash skills and then they have a play session because lets the dog that teaches the dog like, oh, there's the boring bit when you had to sit down and listen to someone drone on. Then there's puppy play and we could be crazy. So I like it to start with craziness and, and gradually the training, you know, integrates in it and infiltrates in it. At which point now, every time we have a training session, maybe as short as call your puppies, have them sit, come sit, tell them go play, go play. What bigger reward? You know, because we by then we're phasing out the food. And so now the puppy comes because he's a uh, time to say hello to the owner, get petted, patted. And then the play is the really big reward. But I, I think the dog dog aspect of it. Yeah, people are really they think socialization means dog dog socialization. Um, and indeed, it is a real selling point for the class. There's no question about it. A video of a puppies playing in a class um, probably would outsell uh, puppies all off leash and being trained in the class. It's the way people are. But remember, it's always about people. Pass the puppy handling. So handled by 24 people in one class, you know, that's more than you have in your home. But I, I wouldn't think of a puppy class as the be all and end all of training. I think that's another misconception people have. They think, oh, I went to puppy class. Yes, so hope it was fun. Training begins at home and it continues at home. Indoors mainly, in your yard also, but that's where all the basics and foundations of training and socialization are set. Puppy class is really a place for you to socialize to more people, learn off key skills with a trainer watching what's going on so they can come up to you and they know 
seeing how this puppy ducked his head and backed off from your, your little boy, they know a little boy will probably get bitten when that dog's a year old. So we can pick out these incipient problems. So we go over to the little boy and give him a special bag of enhanced treats, enhanced kibble, I mean, and teach him how to get the puppy to come and sit and come and sit and come and sit. And the little boy will go back home and practice this and do the homework. The parents won't. The little boy will. Before you know it, in two weeks, the little boy is the dog's best friend. And so it's picking out these incipient, paint such a vivid picture, Dad. Incipient problem, <laughs> fear and aggression, which in adulthood become a whole different kettle of fish in terms of resolution. They take longer and sometimes not without danger. In puppy class week one, I think we save so many dogs' lives right there by uh -huh. picking these little problems up in puppies. Kelly, did you want to add one last? Um, I believe, and I'm not, I have more to add to that, actually. Um, you know, puppy class isn't the be-all, end-all, as Ian said. Um, there's tons of training to be done in the home, which will lead me to my second point in a moment. But also, it's, it's literally like kindergarten. It's like saying, well, my kid attended preschool and kindergarten. Why are they trained? <laughs> and now you know, we like, were <laughs> the beginning. It's not the end. You know, why can't they do algebra? Why aren't they a rocket scientist? Why can't they even sit in a chair? Well, you know, it's a, it's a child in kindergarten. It's a first. It's the first yeah. step. It's not the last step. But also, training is happening in the home, and and life is learned out in the world. You're weaving together this tapestry of experiences that are tailor made to your circumstances and situation when you take your puppy out in your own environment and in your own neighborhood and into your, in your friends' homes. And to that end, I would say our something like our online puppy class would be a great option. Our new essential puppy training course gives you the foundation skills and hopefully the, the knowledge and how to broaden your minds. I think what we tried to do there is demonstrate you know, a foundational skill and then apply it in lots of different situations so that you can learn how to take your puppy into your own environment and neighborhood and, um, you know, and get them and get them trained, whether or not you have a puppy class. So a puppy class is wonderful. Uh, and again, it's good to be with like minded people with, you know, the, the, with a bunch of puppies. It's adorable. It's fun. But um, it is only one piece of the puzzle of raising, raising a good puppy. All right. We love puppy classes. We love talking puppy, about puppy, them. Puppy, puppy class. Um, all right, Kelly, I've got a quickie for you. Annabelle says, how early in a dog's life do you think you need to start training for scent detection work? Like for service dog, uh, service work, detecting allergens, that sort of thing. Or maybe or, just or scent work. work. Yeah, nose yeah. work. Any kind of fun? Any kind, I mean, well, um, how early should you or how early can you? I mean, you can and should start right away. These puppies' noses are working better than their eyes are and ears are at a very early age. So if you have access to early puppies, you know, baby neonates, you know, you can start doing stuff with them right there and then. Familiarizing them with the scents you want them to learn to love by conditioning them, classically conditioning them to these scents. But, I mean, you can start at any age. Um, and in training, if you want them to be able to do, um, like, I, I'm, for service work, I'm guessing it's maybe identifying and, and retrieving certain items, things like that. Um, it's never too early, but it's also never too late. Your dogs speak and see and in scent. I was going to say in smell. In scent. Of course they smell in scent. Uh, but that's how they primarily view the world. Incensed. They <laughs> dogs smell in scent. Well, whatever. I'm just, <laughs> We're still um, working on that one. It's not, 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 no, uh, but, it's not meme ready yet. Smell the world in, in scent with uh, with their olfactory. Anyway, just joking. Um, this is their primary way of navigating and experiencing the world. So it's it's not second nature to them. It is their nature. It's their primary nature. So um, it's just about a man manner of helping them identify, letting you know, like you you telling them which scents are important to you, and then teaching them to tell you when they have identified those things. So it's 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 very easy work for them. It's never too early and it's never too late and it should be fun. It, it should be, you know, it, it's, 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 and, and even if you don't have a service dog, you don't have a specific need for detection dog. I think every dog should do some scent work training because it's such a wonderful way to enrich their lives and their, their home life, their brains, um, their happiness. It calms. I've never seen a dog that scent work training doesn't help. It calms nervous dogs it it focuses hyper dogs it gives confidence to dogs that are 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 meek and shy 
it it's it helps quell reactivity it it's just i've seen it done with 13 year old 14 year old blind dogs i've seen it done with three-legged dogs you know with baby dogs it's, it's, to their toes. <laughs> they sent with their <laughs> Oh, yeah. so you know, unless the dog does has you know has oh, some problems with their own I, I, I would like to actually uh, Kelly kind of took the wind out of my sails. I was gonna say that's mm -hmm. a really nice statement. Um, it's never too early, it's never too late. It is one of those things that we teach where as it gets later and later, it becomes much more difficult, not with <laughs> scenting. The, the dog will yeah. learn at any time in their lives and preset. Right. So if we're talking prior to you know two and a half weeks um we can use the infrared detection that when i was doing my maternal behavior study we had to watch all these little neonates you know grow up into adult dogs so we had little balloons of, of water at different temperatures and we put out like three cold ones and one three degrees warmer uh -huh. and they because they blind and deaf and they only move by it's called rooting they waddle forward, you know, like a slug with their head going from side to side. And that is so they can get the warmth gradient. Right. They're playing literally so, hot and cold. Hot and cold. And um, so we started with that. Then, of course, my, my whole, you know, PhD and 10 years of research was on olfactory preferences. Um, you know, which do you prefer, this or that? And it's a wonderful insight to the dog's mind when you do choice or, or preference um tests but in the home there's so many fun things to teach your dog to find uh, claude used to find lettuce um, yeah. <laughs> I remember that. but um I, I showed a picture of claude working for lettuce you know he's asleep and i bring out the lettuce and i'm ready you know down <laughs> sit and so on but um car keys phoenix i taught to find car keys and the remote control and one day i lost my keys and i said feeny find the keys find the keys and she goes into the couch and pulls out the remote control that i'd lost probably six months before and bought a new one and so you know you fetch your slippers you know we do this on the couch you know we say captain slippers and you'll run over and bring one and then the other one and it's just such a fun thing to do finding things that get lost finding people mm -hmm. you know you do go to round robin retrieves and so i say you know rover go to kelly so kelly says rover come here yes and then it turns into hiding seek so we say jamie go and hide and then kelly and i'll say you know phoenix where's jamie go to jamie so now she's got to use her nose to find you and, and that's a very useful uh, mm -hmm. skill if the dog knows the name of members and can find them yeah so yeah, yeah never too early never too late good words all right so we have now a great plethora of questions. Um, yes, we do. Too many to end in, here. Oh my in the near future, we will be entering the lightning round, where I'll be encouraging even more brevity with our responses. But uh, this one. for now, <laughs> Teresa's, Teresa's question, I watched Julie Case's video where she shows how she desensitizes and socializes puppies. My dog is two and is reactive. Would it make sense to do the same type of training for him at this stage, at this at his age? And Ian, you wanna crack it? Oh out? no, oh no, oh no. The the whole point of um environmental enrichment early on is the neonates can take it. They can't see or hear. And then at four weeks, they're still having difficulty hearing. They can see kind of blurred. Five, they got good eyesight, good hearing, but now they're used to it like with the kindergarten class, handling them, the screaming, the banging the drums, and to the puppets, it's nothing. Because I, I thought we were gonna get some flack on that, saying, that's cruel, what are you doing? The puppets are stressed. No, not one. I analyzed that video. Can I see a single puppy I think is stressed? Now, it's totally normal for a puppy to spook, <gasps> but then come back and get over it. That's the sign of good temperament. The sign of a rock solid temperament is not that it never spooks, but it's when occasionally it spooks, it gets over it quickly. Once you've gone past that at the time, and, and then when they're doing this at eight weeks, then you can do it at three months and on and on. It's like the notion of puppy classes. You know, puppy one's off leash, so we can teach puppy twos off leash. So we can teach puppy threes off leash with adult dogs. And, and always the big reward is, is, is uh, saying, go play again. But if you did this with an adult dog, it would just freak them out. 
you've got to use the same principle and give it environmental enrichment, but you've got to do it slowly and progressively. And let's say if you devoted your life to this at two years, I would say if you had a three month program, you would have a very different dog, you know, in three months time, even though it's already two years old. But the beauty of doing this with neonates and very young puppies, you can hit them with impunity, any noise, any action, and that becomes the status quo. So as they get older, there are no novice stimuli. They're all, hey, been there, done that, puppy class. So, no, we now have to take our time and gradually uh, get them used to weird things in the environment. Lots of time, like I said, for the dog park, lots of time sitting on your front porch, lots of time sitting just out your front gate, giving mm -hmm. the dog a long time to hide and peek and watch the world go by as you praise it and give food rewards at appropriate moments. Mm -hmm. Kelly, do you want to add on to that or do you want a brand new, fresh question? Well, there are a couple of really quick ones I would like to just answer. Um, one is, what age do you find puppies in your puppy classes? The puppy classes that, like you described, are most effective. I love when they start at between 11 and 13 weeks, personally. I think that's the best time for them to start a puppy class. Um, um, if you have a puppy kindergarten for younger babies, that should be a smaller group, smaller age. And the older they get, you know, the, the more challenging it gets um, to get them in that needy, sucky up, follow you stage. So 11 to 13 weeks for starting would be my favorite. Um, have, anyways, go ahead, Jamie. What's your next question? Well, and, and the big, what? I mean, the big difficulty there is what are the other puppies in class? So like if you had uh, all of the puppies of four and a half months old, yeah, they would could all start. But if you have, say, in a fourth month old um big old crazy Labrador, but then a three-month-old cockapoo, Yorkie, Shih Tzu cross. Um, that's a huge age differential. So we've got to spend a lot of energy there toning down the older puppies and building the confidence of the younger ones. But let's put it this way. I've never had a puppy class where it didn't work out. And I'm very careful to make sure the owners of all the little young dogs say thank you to the people who brought along the big dogs or the crazy out of control ones, because now their puppy is not scared of them. It can go on a walk without being freaked. But then I say to the big dog owners, now you thank these people who gulped and brought along their little dogs to this really scary class. So your dogs have learned to be gentle and you know that because everyone's secret fear about their dog is it would harm another dog mm -hmm. or a cat or a child. But you now know you've had proof week after week that your dog, as soon as a little, and I, I love it, it's like this. You'll have two labs like, whoa, whoa, or labby in a pit, you know, whoa, 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 doing this. And then they turn around and, oh, hello. And there's a little dog who's already learned, if you sit, they will go calm. And they go nose to nose and sniff and do a bit of paw raising. Oh. And then they may do some gentle chasing with no contact. But it's wonderful to see that develop, especially, I think, in the little dogs. Yeah. Awesome. So I have uh, many more questions lined up. But we've, also, <laughs> we've, also been at, we've also been at it for an hour now. We I, have not. We have. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Doesn't time go fast when you're having fun? It flies by. Yes. yes. It does. It does. Um, we're going to keep answering questions. This is our last session, so we uh, will definitely answer a, a lot more questions. But before we do, I think it's a perfect time for us to do our group howl. <laughs> so I'm going to ask everyone uh, on the count of three, we're all going to howl together as a, a group bonding exercise. Shame we can't unmute them all. Yeah, I know. It'd, be, be, it'd be great if we could bring up the Zoom screen, you know, like if it was, uh, you know, like a Zoom. But alas, you'll just have to take it on faith. Don't we have it here? The screen of everyone in it? No, we don't. Oh, no. good Lord. Okay. So here we go. On the count of three, people. One, two, <clears throat> three. Oh. 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 Um, no one i'm surprised nobody uh howled into the comments section although that, that might have been a bad suggestion now yeah. i want to do one other thing something i learned from attending uh my dad's oh, oh, I, know it's coming. Uh -huh. I want everyone to raise their right hand 
Everyone raise the right hand. Okay. Giving everyone at home a moment to do it. And then pat themselves uh, on the back yeah. because you are a good owner. You yeah. are a good trainer. The fact that you're yeah. here right now, you know, and there's many other things you'd be doing, learning about dog training, learning how to make your lives dogs better, your li- your dog's lives better, <laughs> means that you're trying, you know, and you you have your heart in the right place. And it's, it's a wonderful thing. We're really happy that you were all here with us. We really appreciate it. And we love helping dogs. We love helping people help dogs. It's, it's a wonderful thing. So thank you very much. Good to- job to you. Remember to be kind to yourself. Give yourself treats. Be, you know, nice to yourself. So on that note, we'll take a few more questions. Uh, let's see. R. Fuller says, my one-year-old GSD loves cats too much. We have six indoor cats. How do I get her to quit stalking them? Our trainer would lo- like us to use an e-collar, but we do not want to. You want to jump on that one, Kelly? Well, I mean, you know, you're going against nature here. You know, um, GSDs in particular are very predatory and love to chase. They're herdy, they're predatory. You know, they love the, the stalking and chasing part and sometimes grabbing part of the of the predatory sequence. And cats, you know, cats are small and fast and darty. Some of them, some of them are slow and, and cool and mellow. And so, you know, you're, you're working against nature there. It doesn't mean you can't do something. I don't know how old everybody is, if this is a new puppy or a dog that's been chasing for years, that all has, you know, that there, you definitely should be working um, proactively to stop this no matter what stage it's at, because it could become dangerous. Um, if, you know, we don't know if you're, if the cats are taunting and this is play or if the German Shepherd is going to eventually grab yeah. you know, it, it could be bad. It could be okay, it could be bad. It's hard to say in this format. Um, so you should definitely take this seriously and the short online video answer without a formal consult would be teach your German Shepherd a very solid place command, get them to stay on their placement, get a nice placement. I like the cot beds for this kind of thing. You can even put a soft bed on top if you want. They have very clear edge there. You can get a nice big one. It's a comfortable place for your dog to stay. It's kind of like an invisible crate where they're learning some impulse control um, while the cats are around, I would also make sure that your cats have a, uh, an easy and um, um, available escape route to a room where the dog cannot get them with a baby gate or a shelf where they can jump over into another room um, so that you know if they ever feel threatened, they can, they can escape. Um, that is a really short answer for kind of a long, problem um because i don't know how bad it is and i don't want to make light of it but i also don't want to overdo it so um i would utilize management as i would teach my dog to be calm around the cats and teach them to go and grab their own toys whenever they're getting that 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 edge of you know i've got two small dogs now um two little terriers and i've got a bunch of hurdy guardy predatory type belgians i got four belgians a rottweiler and two little terriers and the terriers are also the youngest and they run like this, you know, and they do crazy things. And, and then one of them even wants everybody chasing her. And with my dogs, I make sure that like Laz likes to take chase um, in a fun in a way that I know isn't really intentionally dangerous, but still could be. I have taught him to go get a toy and put it in his mouth when he's chasing the other dogs around. And I, I manage the chasing. Don't mind you. I don't let them just go on five acres and go for it. I would absolutely call the big dogs back and, they know when the littles are running, they have to have a toy in their mouth and or be on a place. Or if they're playing with the littles, they have to be on the ground, low, in a down. And that's, they're not allowed to chase through the house. So, um, but that's a lot of management and training, um, which is well worth it. So you can have safety. Now, all I have to say, little one takes off. Little Eve, star of the Essential Puppy Training Course, takes off. She loves to get everybody chasing her. I just say, all right, no, lie down, lie down, get out, get down, no chasing. Cause that's what works best for her is to put her on a place or have her lie down and wait or come to me. And with Laz, I say, get a toy, get a toy. And he goes and he finds a toy and he puts it in his mouth and then he chases her with a toy in his mouth, which means he's not going to bite her. He's not going to grab her. And you know, he's, he's can shake his little toy. He can run around. And again, I know he's not actually going to, he's not a dog that's going to grab and shake. Um, I know this for many reasons at this point, but you know, give them something else to do. Don't allow the behavior to escalate and get out of control. Teach your dog a good place condition them, um, classic condition them to be around each other when they're calm and, you know, like make, make sure you have some hangout time where the 
your dog is doing something calm, hits it with you, watching Netflix or having a call while the cats are just kind of milling about and make sure that the cats have a good escape route. That is, um, cause most cats are going to outrun a dog, you know, if, if the, you know, if it comes down to it. I used to have Phoenix carry a log when I walked her cause she used to chase cat poop. And then she'd come she'd back. Chase, you have to hunt it. You chase it. On it. You know, she's walking nicely. <laughs> on it. Anyway, back to the, the question, you know, dogs and cats, the and, and addressing the concerns here, because we were obviously concerned, otherwise wouldn't ask the question. And so what are the probabilities and percentages? Well, it sounds like since your dog's a year old and you have six indoor cats, your dog has grown up with the cats. Now, if they've had, if that puppy had free access to the cats when he was a puppy, I'm sure the cats have taught him all he needs to know. And the probability is you just won't have a problem at all. You will have uh, beautiful friendships for the rest of your life. However, this thing about wants us to use an e collar, my question is why? I mean, what does an e collar teach a dog? Don't stalk cats. Um, or to hate cats or stay away from it you know little i would say who's it who, who used to say um to use an axe to remove a fly from the forehead of a friend hmm. definitely chinese proverb um it, it is a little bit overkill so you've got to give feedback we just had the opposite a little kitten coming into a household of eight dogs so all the time we're giving the dogs a running commentary because cats taunt. And then when they get older, they stalk, you know, they, they make their dog's life a nightmare. So we're giving a running commentary to one dog at a time and then in groups. Um, now it's just the cat runs the household, um, sleeps with all the dogs one by one, curled up, spends an evening licking their ears. I mean, for 45 minutes. So you don't take it lightly. But the likelihood you're going to have a problem if a puppy comes into a household with resident cats is very, very slim indeed. More difficult is a kitten coming into a household of resident dogs. So I wouldn't worry about it too much, but I would always give them feedback gently. Go and get a Kong. Go and, you know, say, fill your mouth up. Lie down. Let Yes, the cat wants to climb over your body and lick your eyeballs, you know. The cat has um, rules supreme here, so don't forget that. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I don't think you'll have a problem. It occasionally happens, and a terrier would be the the main breed group that suddenly revert after three to four years of peacefully living together, and then one day you come home and you have an injured cat. Which isn't but, even aggression, right? It's just predatory sequence happening. It's alligator brain taking over for a second. Yeah, and in those instances, I, I always think, you know, I bet they weren't growing up freely integrating, as the owner said, that I, I, I believe very little what owners tell me unless I've seen it. And because I still don't believe that the terrier suddenly flipped. I mean, you know, we had a Jack Russell. We always had cats and they, they were fine. And Jack Russell lives for 16 years without killing a cat. So it's so rare. It's one of those things that we, we worry intensely about, but usually doesn't happen. But I still wouldn't take it lightheartedly, as I wouldn't dogs and children. I mean, people will let dogs around kids like without a care. And now you're worried about the cat, you know. And so I always pay attention, you know, when the dog's with the children. And it's like, remember when you were young, and uh, I left you and Isaac alone with Phoenix, who was now what, five, six years old. Yeah, that was your your mistake, right? My mistake, I and I never did it again. I was an innocent child. But she came into the house all sad and dripping wet, and I said, Jamie, Isaac, what did you do? And they had been hunting Malamute with water cannons. <laughs> and so I said, well, now you can repair the damage by practicing come sits and make up for Phoenix. Well, oh, I thought you were going to say you, you line them up at a wall and then water pistol them. <laughs> or let the Phoenix do it. Let <laughs> on the shoes. <laughs> you want to be voice down. Right, you want to do it. You want to get a, a water fight with a Malamute. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, all, right, all right, so a similar question. Um, I should also point out, of course, we're not going to get to everyone's questions today, but if you if we don't get to your question, we will still answer it. 
if you join the Top Dog Academy, send us your questions. We'll answer yes. it for you. You'll be answering questions for weeks. Well, not only that, so we, so we do offer email support there, which the questions get answered if they come in by email. And then we also pop into the Facebook group. That's the Private Top Dog Academy Facebook group. And we do video responses and comment responses and post responses. And so, you know, right. we try to get out there. And the, the secret, the reason we are able to answer email questions, and it doesn't take my whole work week, is because everyone who's asking us questions is already a member of the Top Dog Academy. So 90% of my questions are, oh, yes, that's a very common issue. <laughs> I'm very sorry to hear you're struggling with that. Please check out this link and this link and this link for explanations about what to do after you've watched that material. Please let me know if you have any further questions. A per personalized reference library to a degree, but we do actually literally answer questions. Right. No. So usually a, a lot of people then go, they'll watch the relevant videos, and then they might have follow-up questions. But yeah. it means we're already, like, I'm not answering remedial okay. stuff because all that's not only explained, well, it's it's demonstrated in our, that's the whole in our courses. Yeah, it's like when I answered questions on the Facebook page, my most common answers were go to the uh, dog behavior compendium right, and look up barking. And then we can come back. And I think we're going to deal with questions for the um, our legacy members um, in, in different ways now as well. Not just Jamie typing away, but to have uh, Q&A sessions where we get the questions and you see, there's only so many dog questions to ask and then group them together. Five people have asked pretty much the same question, but little variations. One's a city dog, one's rural, but they're all barking. So now we do the barking spiel and then we say how we would modify it for each individual person. And I think then we can deal with several questions at a time. It's like here. What do we do with a dog that doesn't like food? You know? What do we do with a fearful dog? What do we, there's only so many doggy questions to ask. And, and that is, I mean, fun for us to do because then it's an excuse for us to get together again and laugh and giggle because now we are split by miles. Well, you guys are together. I'm jealous are you, today. Are you in Alaska? Has the sun gone down? It's black in the background. Well, I am practically in Alaska, A. Um, yes. B, uh, no, it's, it's, I have to turn the light on back and back of me off because otherwise it shines like I'm an angel. Uh, uh, <laughs> doesn't sound so bad. Oh, I would turn the lights on. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Very nice. It's nice. Nice outside. Actually, it's, I have to go training. So it's my training Tuesday. Well, every day is training day, but I have uh, a group that comes to my house on, on Tuesdays. Soon it's time to start. And then, yeah, we still have the boy here. He's doing great. He's, yeah, he's not thrilled today, but he'll live. And the baby boy. Uh, I see Heather asked, um, <laughs> so I signed up for Dunbar Academy a year ago. Is that the same thing? So yeah. Dunbar Academy is the name of the website, dunbaracademy.com. But um, we offer several courses there. And you can register, you can enroll in courses a la carte, just a single course. You get lifetime access. What we're talking about here is the Top Dog Academy, which is specifically a subscription, gives you access to all of the courses. And as we're saying now, personalized email support, as long as you uh, sign up before February 16th. Let me have a go at explaining that. Let's see. Dun Dunbar Academy is the website. That's correct. There's two parts of subscription part. So if you're paying subscription, yeah, that's the Top Dog Academy. And a large free part. There's a lot of courses on there that are free to anyone who just goes to Dunbar Academy and hunts around, strangely enough, free courses for professionals and for owners. Indeed. We have a lot of free courses available yeah. to uh, dog owners and dog professionals. But let's get back to uh, our questions. Let's see. We got one from Alan. Um, I imagine we're going to have some overlap with our last uh, cat stalking question, but... He, he says, hi, I have two intact two-year-old palms, and they tend to occasionally fight. Should I separate them or let them figure it out? Never seen any injury, but wondering more emotionally about uh, injury, I guess. So uh, your choice, dog's choice. So you decide, intervene. If it's upsetting you, tell them, go to your bed, lie down, be quiet. Uh, if you want to know the dog's choice, you take hold of one by the collar, see what the other one does. Does it run and hide and not come out for a week? Or does it come up to the dog you're holding and say, hey, do you want to play? And then vice versa. But the, you answer the question yourself. There's no damage done. So basically, you can do whatever you like as long as you're happy. Um, your dogs are happy. 
if the dogs are happy, I would say, you know, I like, I love the bully test that Ian's talking, describing where you, you know, you hold one and to see, because some people are, I mean, I'm not saying you are in this case, but sometimes it's play or it's rough play or it's a little discussion and squabble that needs to be done. So it's good to like take, take the temperature and see how they're feeling. Are they enjoying this? Uh, who's the instigator? Um, you know, take turns with the collar holding thing when this happens. But I would say I wouldn't let them practice kind of crappy behavior that you don't want to see more of. I mean, it means that, you know, behavior is always in motion. And if it's not going in the direction you like, which often it won't be because humans and dogs have different ideas about what's acceptable and normal and fun, you've, you've got to constantly be you know, curving, you know, to, you know, correcting the route a little bit. Um, and that just means not taking things for granted. You know, even in trained dogs or dogs that get along, still do some classical conditioning, still do some side-by-side -side walks and some fun training together and still teach them to sit near each other with their toys and not bother each other or, you know, whatever it may be that will help your, your dynamic um, thrive versus maybe chip away with annoyances or irritation. You know, going back to a joyful little Eve and her, um, her nightly and well, daily morning and night and evening you know, zooms and, uh, you know, band leading with getting everybody going. She also um, can be too much for Villa sometimes. My other little terrier who's only like, I don't know, not even a, not even a year older than her, who thinks she's, she looks so mature now next to an adolescent border terrier. And so I don't let her harass her. I mean, I do let them work some stuff. I don't let Villa tell her off. But often I look at Villa and she's like, I don't want to tell her off. I don't want to play. I don't want to fight. I don't want to babysit. I want her to go away and I want her to calm down. So then I do intervene and say, Eve, come and get your chew toy or come over here with me or tether to me for a minute. I'm going to hold a leash until she settles back down or remove Villa, let her go hang out with another dog in another room because I don't want the classical conditioning work that's happening between Villa and Eve to be that Villa starts to really not like Eve because that will be a slippery slope. Um, so it's a little bit of both, right? It's, it's There's not a, an absolute here. I think you have to play, uh, you know, and I do. You watch, you see, how's it going? Is it one-sided? How's the other one look? Do they, are they, can they, it does not bother them? Uh, and then uh, intervene, as, as you say, as Ian says, when, you know, when, uh, when, you know, when, if other dogs are, if they're happy. Don't intervene if they're not happy. Don't intervene if they're happy, intervene if they're not happy. Yeah, I, I think um, many of these questions, you know, people are being very, like, precise what should i do as if there's one answer so there's many variables dog's age is really an important variable but next up for me is um dog's choice shelter's choice what does your dog feel about this next up is your choice if it upsets you tell the dog cease and desist and so like the way we handle it in our household there is absolutely no barking or growling or fighting or in the living room, and no bringing chew toys on the couch. You may bark, though, one bark for an alert, something's going down outside. Um, no fighting in the training room, and no barking. You know, outside, no, you can play, chase, roll, bark. Occasionally, if we're doing it, we think it's getting a little over the top, we don't settle down. You know, just use your voice to give them instructions. So teach them the meaning of the instructions, but still no barking. Why? The uh, arena's outdoors and the neighbors can hear it. And, and we're the settle down is important, right, Ian? You know, bring, don't, the settle yeah. down is important. Don't yeah. let things go. Bring things back down. Bring th Like with kids, you don't let them just go until someone's crying, you know? Yeah, you, you don't have to bring them back to you right now. You're going to do a two-minute down state. Just say, hey, oh. just or yeah. as i said to jambo in the video uh, don't hump uh, you know don't bark you can play and sniff and pour and chase but it has to be done quietly and no humping absolutely um so it's it's your choice and it's um the, the options there's a thousand different options remember when we used to play games and um we had the penalty box the bottom of the stairs in the house and we'd say, Dune, that's a penalty. Penalty. And he had to lie in the penalty box for 10 or 20 seconds, like in hockey. I mean, you can even have fun. And, and I don't think the dog thought it was an aversive punishment at all. Oh, that was a question you missed, which you said we should talk about that. Um, it was just a laugh. But because we have control, everything we do or ask, we don't know whether it's play or whether it's training. 
The point is the dog is in control now, so we can monitor and change the flow or intensity of the behavior or even the specific behaviors. And, and that's what it's all about. All right, um, guys, I must go. My, my, I have to leave. I have to go train. Training Tuesday. It's training Tuesday, and my partner in training is here. Yeah. He's come two hours to visit, so let's right. go. You want to say bye, Kelly? I think good we'll, to see you. We'll stay on for another few Thank more. Thank you, minutes. everybody. Very good we'll to see you. Thank you for attending. Oh, and we'll see you in the, in, the, um, in the Facebook group, and we'll see you hopefully at the Dunbar Academy, and so we can continue chatting anytime. Bye-bye. All right. Bye, Kelly. Bye. What was the question you asked me before we started about? Was this an aversive punishment? I will get to that. I'll give oh, okay. you. I'll give you the two questions we had lined up. Okay. I, Jamie's questions. But oh, um, oh, first, right. I'm going to ask you one more. One more submitted question from our audience. Um, latest tips for extreme distance work for field trial dogs. Uh, we know they want to get their retrieves. Uh, they're assuming it's using a vibration collar to teach reward tones or feel at greater distance, but maybe their assumption's wrong. Well, with field dogs, I'd just go back to the basic whistle um, because it can carry the distance. Um, and um, the training starts in your living room. And what, the way I do it is what we want to teach the dog is if it's field work, sit. Sit and watch me. If it's a shepherding, it's down and wait for the next whistle. So this is how I got my sort of philosophy for training puppies that you let them play, play, play on automatic, auto, 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 sit, auto, 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 sit. So I tell owners, all we have to teach is an extremely reliable sit, no matter what's going on, no matter what the dog's doing at a distance and distracted. And so we start the, the homework doing it indoors and we work with the sequence, sit down, sit, stand down, stand, because what we want is we sit from the stand, okay? And then the sit from the stand in motion. Then the sit from the stand in motion at a distance. So to get to the distance part, um, we, a number of ways to do it. Uh, I just taught little um, distance exercises. She's a slow moving dog. So when we're doing the retrieval, she goes out there really quickly but she's delicate about picking it up because it's sandy. So she'll pick it up and then drop it and captain will bring it back. But she's only got three fast roll recalls in her. And then she comes back at a waddle. And I just say, little, sit, sit, whoa, sit. And she just got it the first trial. Had to repeat the command a number of times. But she's about, oh, 80 feet out. And so now she does it the full 180 feet. I just say, little, sit. And she goes plonk and looks at me. Because now I have to throw it directly at her for her to be able to retrieve it because Captain's so fast, she's tired now. So usually I have to hit her with the ball and then she may get it before him. So that's one way to do it. Uh, with Zuzu, we did the same. So Kelly walked on ahead with Zuzu on a long line. I'm lagging. Then I said, Zuzu, sit. No response because I'm, I'm about 40 yards off. So I come up to her really quickly saying, Zuzu, sit. Zuzu, sit. Zuzu, sit. And then she sits. I say, good dog. There's a good dog. Okay. And then walk up to her, praise, give her a treat. As you repeat that, because everyone just say, you repeat the command. Oh, you should be crucified or four drawn and quartered. You know, no. What you find is if you do that and keep doing it on each trial, the number of commands you give before the dog sits decrease progressively with Zuzu. I think it was 16 or 17, I had to say. And then it comes down like this, you know, and remember it comes down. So now we're only giving four commands, but oh, on the next trial, we had to give eight. So don't let that upset you. It comes down like this until you're giving one command a good 95% of the time. That means you have a dog that 95% of the time will sit with a single command. At the same time, the distance goes whoop, to infinity. So if you watch the uh, bit of Omaha and the video that was filmed right before he died, he died about five weeks after that, he is sitting a hundred yards away. And there's actually a drug deal going on. That's what he's looking at. That's why he's not looking at me, but he's listening to me. And so they are hundred yard distance commands with a Malamute. So if you have a quick dog though, it's difficult to do that. 
because whatever you say, Rover, the dog just does a recall. He's in front of you. So we put them on these training platforms, as you saw me do with Wookie. So platform means platform and sit. And then we back up. And then we're going to say stand and then sit, which is what we want, sit from the stand. So what you find is the most difficult distance is the first yard. OK, because the dog may know sit down, sit, stand down, stand all at 95 percent response reliability. You go back one yard and now you're repeating the command, you know, two or three times, just one yard. So the training sequence there is your distance sit is like this. You say, Rover, sit. Rover, sit. So the dog understands this. He doesn't understand this, sit or that. You get it? But he will learn if you keep doing distal command, proximal command. Distal, and the dog goes, oh, you mean when you do this at a distance, you want me to? Oh, well, I know that. Well, because you get happy when I sit, I'm just going to do it when you're here. You can then go to two yards and three yards and five yards, ten yards, uh, uh, sorry, two yards, five yards, eight yards, ten yards, twenty yards, and you've got your distance command. If you've got extreme distance, though, as you were talking, to communicate it, I would use a whistle. I mean, you can't shout that loud. And you can either use the whistle means sit and face and have coded whistles, you know, <whistles> means sit and face and <whistles> means come when called and then go out, go left, go right. Or if it's sit and face and you're, you're within 150 yards, you can then give hand signals, very clear hand signals. And this is what I use for recall, you know, come and give us a kiss. But distance commands are wonderful because uh, many uses in the house. You're on the couch and you say uh, down. Dog doesn't understand it. If you haven't taught down a distance, bed down. So you can do a lot of prior training indoors and then in the yard. And then you build the extreme. And I like to go straight to a dog park from there. And so most dogs come to the park, they let off leash, and the owner's now emailing and not paying attention. No, my dog, every 25 to 30 seconds, I just say, Omaha, sit, good boy, go play. That's it. No treats, no external rewards, go play, reinforces the dog. Well, you could say that's an external reward, but now he's actually been rewarded by the sitting. Mm -hmm. He knows this is something I enjoy doing with my owner. And when I sit, remember the dopamine talk, the happy hormones, the oxytocin, you know, when I do it, or endorphins, these are all happy hormones, man. It's a big pack. And now when I sit, I enjoy doing it. The response becomes the reward. And that's what all this is about, because then it will become a reward for you, too, because you get a sense of fulfillment when you see. I mean, to this day, mm -hmm. when I say go pee and a dog pees, man. I just get a little dopamine blast. Mm -hmm. I feel good when I say uh, Rover sit 100 yards away. It's an oxytocin explosion of love. I love that dog. <laughs> and so training should really, you know, I think we've 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 got way off track. We're looking at it all the wrong way. It becomes so clinical. We've forgotten the major word is relationship partner. The two of you are dancing the tango of training mm -hmm. and you should have smiles on your face the whole time. And when you look in the mirror, lighten up and brighten up, you'll suddenly find your dog's more interested in you. <laughs> Lovely. Yeah. So I actually have a question that I wanted to ask you after um, spending some time on the Summit Facebook group uh, earlier today in the past couple of days. Um, so here's Jamie's question. Here's my question. What do you do? If you see a dog owner or dog trainer using a technique or piece of equipment that you don't like to use, um, especially if you think that technique or equipment is aversive and or ineffective. Well, the last thing I would do, which is sadly a knee jerk reaction for many people and many trainers would be to go up and give them grief. Now, if what they were doing is illegal, I would report them. So if you remember that time when we were skiing and that man kicked his dog and it lifted in the air and fell down, sorry, <coughs> that is called premeditated animal abuse. So I got the police there and he was led off in handcuffs and we drew quite a crowd, if you can remember. <laughs> um, but if it's not illegal and some techniques, although I disapprove of them, they're still legal, 
I would certainly not abuse the owner and say, you shouldn't be doing that. That's disgusting. Like basically saying, I'm on a high horse and you're a more awful person than I am because of what you do, because I've now lost the chance to help that dog out. So when we play the bozo game, we run these, you know, routines by people and you have to respond in real time what you would say to me. So you don't say, well, I would say this or I would do this or I would write a letter of complaint for the Times. You know, you have to do it. So I say, right. This was real, a real case. Four and a half month old Springer in class wearing a shock collar. <laughs> Go on, respond. <laughs> so if you say, what are you doing? Take that away. I say, oh, screw you. I'm leaving this class. As soon as you do that in the bozo game, everyone says you killed the dog. And what they mean is because you were so nasty to that person and you hounded them online and said awful things just because of one, like they were, had a pinch collar on or they were using a shock collar in a, a country where it is legal, that now you can't educate that owner about all your vast knowledge as a positive dog trainer to improve this dog's life. And that's sad. So I bite my tongue. And I go up and I always say, oh, God, I love Jack Russell's. Oh, can I say hi to your dog? I say, I grew up with Jack Russell's. Now, I actually did grow up with Jack Russell, but I'll say it. Oh, I grew up with Poms. I will lie through my teeth because as soon as I say the word Pom to a Pom owner, they just melt. I say, oh, lovely. You know, what's her name? Oh, she's fantastic. I said, can I say hello? And I said, I have a treat here. Could I, I give her one? You know? And then sit, down, sit, stand, down, come, sit, come, sit. God, you've, wow, you've trained her up, man. How did you do this? She's really good. I'm trying to sucker them. And if she said, so in the Bozo game, we play this. I remember Gwen Bonenkamp, who was the best people trainer I've ever met in my life. Amazing. That the guy came into class with a big rot. He said, I don't want to use food. And she said, oh, that's fine. It's okay. He's got a big old pinch collar on the dog, yank like this, and the dog barks, yank, and then he hung the dog, you know, and I'm trying to get her attention. I was auditing the class, you know, and she had her back turned, and eventually she saw him, and she went over and said, oh, what a beautiful Roddy. I love Roddy's like this, and he just stood up at the beginning of class. I'm not using food in training, and she said, come here, big boy, and sit, and down, and stand, stay, whoa. Look at that body, everyone. That is a perfect stack. Oh, yeah. Now, this guy actually didn't gobble that up. He said, I thought I said I didn't want to use food in training. She said, oh, no, no, no. That's fine. That's fine. Come here. Sit down. Sit. Stand. And he's like looking at her like this and said, you said you didn't want to use food in training, right? I always do because it's so quick and fast and effective, and the dog loves it. you got the best dog in class. And she <laughs> I sucked don't, him in. I don't know how you're going to do it she, without, without she, the food. She reeled him in, uh -huh. and he became a class member, and his dog became really well trained. And eventually he came up and said, I don't need this anymore. Do I? I said, no, you got your dog trained off leash. Yeah. What's the point of all these fancy collars, you know? That, that's always been one of the uh, aspects of your philosophy that I admire the most, that you you recognize you don't have to agree with someone 100% to have a conversation with them, to respect them, to spend time with them, or even to learn something from them. You know, like, yeah, they might be doing something you don't like, but there still could be things that you might learn oh, from yeah. them. Oh, absolutely. And I still have the opportunity to educate the owner to educate their dog. And that's what it's all about for me. And as dog trainers, it's all about people skills because if you are too holier than thou and high on your horse about little knee jerk things, you must bite your tongue because if you speak out against that owner, you think they want to come to your class to have you, you know, harass them and badger them all the time? No. So you killed that dog. You. Yeah. Not him you he's listening to trainers but you don't have anything to say other than he's a horrible person you're not showing him how to do it and it's what i said on their first q a i think we should spend more time trying to do a better job ourselves and showing them what we can do with your dog in five minutes which is of course um, was the one of the guiding lights of this summit the summit was, yeah you know like a lot of summits um involve a lot of talk 
you know, a lot of PowerPoint presentations and those are all well and good, but that with dog training, one of the most powerful things you can do is show it actually working. So we really tried to challenge our presenters to film some footage of actual training dogs and see actual behavior training happen. And that's what we're going to be working on yeah, in the coming and, year. And we did, we did want a mix of presentations. We did want some PowerPoint because people are familiar with them and learn much better from the PowerPoint when they have the graphics. And I thought, for example, like for um, house training, it doesn't, what are you going to film? Right. There's you only know, so many times you can dogs show. Peeing and yeah. pooping. So that's where PowerPoint makes sense. But I did want people to see what you can do with a dog, like the Wookiee. That's the first time I ever trained Wookiee in my life. Like with Walter, you know, a Jambo I had, you know, spent a little time with. I actually was the one who drove him down from guide dogs to um, L.A. as I'm doing mm -hmm. after skiing, picking up another dog. And so, yeah, it's just show them what you can do and smile and nod your head a lot, you know, and whatever they say, that, just that is powerful. Say, oh yeah, yeah. 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 And I totally agree with you there. You know, it's like if you have, you're talking to someone from a different political apart party. Oh yeah. Yeah. Now yeah, get your point. And also boom, then mm -hmm. state your view. Right. But I think when I look at dog training over the past 50 years, when I started the puppy classes, which is uh 40 years ago this week, right? Um, we started doing it off leash using some science, some food lures, food rewards, fun and games, you know, rewards and so on. And it really reached a peak about 95 to 2000. Everyone was teaching puppy classes off leash. Canine games would have 72 dogs all off leash. I mean, it was wonderful, but it's gradually crept back on leash as we took out instructions. Um, I remember when clicker training started, they told me, you, you, you shouldn't lure, you shouldn't give instructions. That's not pure shaping. And I thought, where are you coming from? I'm talking about pure training. My dog now listens to what I say and does it. That's what we want, surely. But we took out instructions. We took out guidance. And then, of course, we took out praise. It was supplanted by the food tree. No, the praise was meant to come first and then the piece of kibble afterwards. So the praise becomes the secondary reinforcer. Instead, then we brought in the click instead of praise as a secondary reinforcer and food treats as, as the primary. But we've forgotten to talk to our dogs and, and give the feedback. Mm -hmm. And I think it's a, it's a crying shame. And because of that, we're not training dogs as easily, as quickly or as effectively as was done in the 90s. And that I want to come back because now my response to anyone I see is I go up, sit down, sit, come sit, come sit, come sit down, bang, roll over. And you've got them right there. Mm -hmm. so, All right. I'm going to ask you one more question. And uh, then I think we're going to sign off and call this summit uh, finished. Well, hour and 40 minutes. But, well. I'll just remind the everyone they've got, uh, if they want us to at answer their questions, they can do it. Uh, join the Top Dog Academy before the 16th, and we'll answer all your questions. I will. I'm, I'm going to do this. This is basically promotion. I'm going to do it my way. How I feel about um, Dunbar Academy, um, not to subscribe, is probably the stupidest thing you could ever do in your doggy careers. When I think my whole career is up there, digitized by Jamie, it's so deep. If you binged watch, it would take you three months to do it. Um, the one change that's going to happen is after February the 15th, um, if you sign up before, you will be part of the Top Dog Academy. You'll get everything we ever make will go up there. Plus, you may ask email questions. Sign up February the 16th or later, and you're no longer, you, well, you don't become a legacy member. That's that club is closed. That club is closed that on the club 16th. Is closed. All, All right. right. Hit me with the last, last question. question. Okay. Jamie again. Uh, let's see. Do you think confining a dog to a crate or putting them on a tether is an aversive punishment? Well, you're asking two questions. Um, one is, I, I'll just use the crate. Um, is putting the dog in the crate aversive? is putting the dog in the crate a punishment. So let's take the first one first. 
um, whether or not it's aversive depends on whether the dog likes it or not. Uh -huh. And that depends wildly on prior training. So if you follow the instructions in our before and after books and, you know, all the videos on Dunbar Academy, no, it's a great advantage to have a dog crate trained. If ever you want to go on holiday, if you ever want the dog to stay with someone else, if you're staying in hotels, it's wonderful to have a dog when you say in your crate, or eventually if you crate trained it, you just say on your bed. You no longer need the walls because the dog's happy to be there because that was Kong City. Yeah. That's where I ate every meal that wasn't hand fed. And so if the dog has been trained to enjoy it, of course it's not aversive. If, on the other hand, you did no training, I want the dog to be free, I want my dog to be free, and then you come to us when it's eight months to a year old, fed up, the dog's destroying the house, chasing the cat, running around, acting like a total idiot. So now you're thinking you're crating him. I say, well, you can't. That would be cruel. You can't give a dog animal liberty and then take it away. No, we totally confine young puppies. Then we give them liberty for the rest of their life. And so now to crate train a dog that doesn't like it, yeah, it's going to be a slow and progressive technique. Classically conditioning the dog to, you know, eat from Kongs close to the crate, then in the crate with the crate door open, then in the crate, but tied in the crate so the dog can't leave, bring the Kong out, then eventually in the crate. Then what we're going to do is shut the dog in for 30 seconds, then open the door and take the Kong away from the dog. Then we're going to put the Kong in the crate and close the door with the dog on the outside, do all this stuff. So whether or not it's aversive depends on how the dog feels about it. Is it punishment? Well, I have to ask you a question. You were trying to inhibit the frequency of a particular behavior. What was that? If so, did it work? If it worked and solved your problem, then yeah, it was a punishment, but it needn't be aversive. You see so many people say an aversive punishment. No, there are non-aversive punishments. We call them instructions. Woof, 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 shush. Bounce around, jump in your lap, get your Kong, go to your bed, settle down. They're punishments, but I'm not even raising my voice. I'm giving instructions. And this is where the whole, the whole reward punishment binomial was just so wrong from the start. They are not in equal footing. They're in different leagues. Mm -hmm you know, that reward training are the warriors, you know, and because it's so powerful, it's so quick. Why is it so powerful? Because every time you reward, the dog will be more likely to do that in the future. So more opportunities to reward. So it'll be even more likely to do it in the future. So eventually it's all the time. It loves lying down and being quiet. There's no time to bark. It just squeezes it out. So reward training is so powerful. So what about the punishment bit? Well, that's to reduce the frequency of behaviors you don't want, like barking. I say, shush, let them sniff a food treat. Then after three seconds, I let them eat the food treat. It's a punishment. If you check out now how many barks per day on your bark activity counters, for any of you that bought them 10 years ago and still have one, you know, you'll find, oh my word, number of barks a day has dropped from 1,132 to 49. Uh, that's a powerful punishment. What was it? Shush, a whisper, shush. And a food treat. You see, this notion, you, you've really, you, 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 this enormous question you've asked here, which to me, this is a one day seminar, two day seminar, <laughs> aversive punishment. For a punishment, for something aversive to be a punishment is very difficult because it requires a lot of training savvy, excellent timing, and you have to meet many criteria. There are a lot of people who are extremely aversive. I would say less than. 99% of shocks given by a dog owner are punishments. I would say 90% of shocks given by a trainer aren't punishments. Why do I say that? Well, the proof is, why is the dog still wearing the shock collar? Duh. You know, well, why is that other trainer still doshing out treats? I tell you what, they weren't reinforcements. If you're still hand feeding the dog from an enormous bait bag, you didn't use them properly. So they reinforced the behavior or inhibited the behavior. Mm -hmm. I like to do it. I know Jamie's getting very antsy here, so I'll hug him. Then he'll let me talk a little longer. <laughs> I like to do it just with my voice. And one of the things I do with questions when they're asked is I cross out the word dog and put in child or baby. Ah, 
now we suddenly have a different mm, answer. It's, it's sending your child to their room. Yeah, what do we, yeah, sending a child to the room, time out. What a waste of training time. I know people who've sent kids, what do they call it? You are grounded for two weeks. That isn't a punishment. It's misery for your child. You know, if on the other hand, your child says, I hate you. I don't like that. You really upset me now. That would probably be a punishment. Yeah, I smacked my hands. That was scary. But then I said, you really upset me. That's what's going to hurt the child the most. Okay. Mm -hmm. But they probably won't say such horrible, stupid things like that again. So we always test when we're using reinforcements, when we're using punishments. Are they reinforcing and are they punishing? We must quantify. We must quantify because then you'll realize what a crummy job you're all doing. And when I say that, I mean me as well. As soon as I quantify. I or think, or maybe you'll realize what an excellent job you're doing. It's possible. No, I, I realize what a job I'm doing. Let's say I, I noticed the other day that stand stays on a couple of dogs have really dipped mm -hmm. to disappearing. Mm -hmm. I'm doing a crummy job. So once I test you and let's say I realize your stand stays at 46 percent reliability, it'll soon be back up to 95. Mm -hmm. And that's the beauty of quantifying. It gives you the benchmark to keep your standards up and to walk towards. And then everyone else knows. And so I want you to go back and those of you who have bought the add-ons for the summit and watch Wookie again, the whole 40 minutes. I want you to count how many food treats I gave, how many body position changes Wookie did, and how many seconds of stay the dog was in for how many treats. Set that as a benchmark, do it with the dog, do better than me and send me that video. And I'll be the first person to learn from you and congratulate you. That's what dog training should be like. And then again, back to what you said, it's why we wanted a lot of video of trainers, hey, putting their reputations on the line. Here we are, we're gonna do this. And some of them in the worst of possible situations, they had to film it today. They had no special dogs. They had no locations. I just said, we need a video from you, please, from you, you know? And uh, and to what you were just saying about, you know, watch the Wookiee, use that as a benchmark, try it yourself. That's one of the things I'm really hoping that we will be doing um, in Top Dog Academy 2022 oh, yeah. is asking our students to film themselves working with their dogs and sending us footage that we can then use to create more learning content. Because we know, you know, it's one thing to hear us explain concepts um, it's one thing to see even one of us demonstrate a concept. But then when you try it yourself, that's where you run into the troubleshooting. That's where you run into the, the issues that maybe we didn't yeah. anticipate. That's so I'll, I'll make another announcement then. And Jamie doesn't know this. So I made a decision um, when I was uh, doing this serious study um, that for years I've wanted to have a, um, a research center online. So we're going to do it at the Top Dog Academy. And I'm gonna start off with that first serious study showing people how any trainer can do a simple study that has amazing statistical significance. Could a regular dog owner? And do even a dog owner, yeah, dog No, I don't mean even a dog, of course they could. It's just repeating the same thing and keeping track of numbers. And with dog training, you see, at the moment, I, that's why I founded the APDT Foundation for this, for trainers to do their own research. But it hasn't sort of started yet. You know, so we're going to show them how it's done. The research is on like cognition or personality or complicated stuff. But dog training is about causing behavior change. And so the significance of Measurable. this is huge. And so I gave you a way where you can look at your data by visualizing it in, say, a histogram, and you can say that is highly significant and that statistics are simply not necessary because it meets the intraocular trauma test. When you graph out before scores and after scores, there's daylight in between. Those data are significant. And I want loads of people to do started length of sit stay, speed of recalls, that we have a standard set distance, 49 feet. You know, so everyone's doing the same study. So now we know who we want to speak at our seminars, who we want to listen to. Mm. Obviously, the people with the best scores. Yeah. 
And when people beat me, I shall be the first person to write them. Say, how on earth did you teach that? And I know what they'll say. Practice, practice, practice. <laughs> That's why I always want training to be quick and easy. I tell yeah. everyone, because the owners want it quick and easy. No, the real truth is, raw truth, we'll leave you with this. I want it quick and easy because I have very little patience to practice. <laughs> All right, guys, we're going to leave you. Thank you so I've had very much for joining away. us. Thank you, everyone. We Thank had you. a blast. We hope you did, too. <laughs> and uh, we hope you stay in touch. We hope you'll join the Top Dog Academy. We'd love to continue this relationship that's been blossoming and a very big thank you to isaac and mitch for putting this together they were the tech people behind the scenes that's, way down in uh, australia that's in pet summits brisbane the team at pet summits they pet did a summits. fantastic com. job and um, it was fun working with you guys but you know what that was a lot of work i'm really glad we can celebrate today jamie and the, and it's over but we're going to do whole load of webinars and q and a's now at dunbar academy so yeah tell your friends to sign up subscribe yeah. Friend, we'll friends don't there. let friends miss out on the best deal <laughs> friends don't let friends miss out on the top dog academy <laughs> let's go play some virtual golf now we're together well no no now no, we can we play can real play golf thing yeah all right okay bye, bye everybody. everybody ciao bye